attending this live webinar um, series. And let me give you a little bit of background um, of what this is about. So if we look at the history of what is uh, of our world and we look at the events that happened in art, uh, specifically centered around Shakespeare, we start to see how art becomes this revolutionist that hid in the shadows. Uh, Shakespeare, we can look at his works and there's a theory out there that says that Marlowe, Christopher Marlowe and Shakespeare were the same people. And so that's sort of the theory that I'm going with on this. Um, we look at Marlowe and Dr. Faustus and his play, which was a personification of the seven deadly sins. Envy, greed, gluttony, lust, which I call desire, sloth, which I'm also calling cheating, pride, and wrath. And we can see how Shakespeare, in his plays, in which he took royalty, people who were considered gods of the peasants and the commoners during that time, and he showed their flaws. He exposed their flaws, how they were envious and greedy and glutton and slothful and prideful and wrathful, the seven deadly sins that Christopher Marlowe had personified which he had adapted from um, Wolf, Wolfgang Goethe. Now, I'm not going to go into Dr. Faust's and Goethe because I still need to read the whole thing in the entirety. I only read the, I think I only read the personification of the seven deadly sins when I was in grad school to do the costuming for it. But the Shakespeare plays, I know a lot better. Um, I took a couple of classes in college. Um, I did Hamlet as my script analysis um, class where we really dissected it in action points. And I think it's really interesting that Shakespeare, when you really look into his plays and you really look in the time period of those plays and the events that are transpiring as far as a revolutionary plane, Shakespeare becomes the shadow revolutionist. And I think that's the power that artists have to be the revolutionists that work in the shadows. Costume design. Our job is to make the audience believe the lie that we're presenting on stage. And if there is a flaw in that illusion, something out of place on that costume, it is completely shattering of that illusion. It pulls the audience out of the lie that they paid to believe in. The lie is the illusion. We know that the actors aren't really kings and queens and villains and saints. We know that that stage is not really Verona, Italy. We know these things as an audience, but we pay to have our suspension of belief um, removed or, or, or to suspend our belief into that lie. We know these things, but we want to believe that lie because we want the story behind it. And so artists, theater artists, will purposely create lies on stage using illusions in order to create a human message, a story that the audience then receives and thinks upon their own life in reflection to the characters who, during the script, the theater artists have given moral excuses on why they were right in their actions. One of the great plays that I use all the time for my examples is Romeo and Juliet. And this becomes a great way to illustrate this idea. Romeo and Juliet is probably the most overplayed Shakespeare play. Everybody does it. So everybody pretty much knows Romeo and Juliet. You've seen it in film over again. The beautiful thing about Romeo and Juliet is this love story between a woman and a man, and this conflict that keeps them apart. And it's a great way to play with these ideas of human interaction and human relationships and human engagement, man, mankind's interaction with mankind in a world of conflict and others. Um, a great book to read, um, if you're really interested in this, is um, John Updike's, I think, I think that's the author, realm of art, where he talks about the philosophical idea of art being mankind versus mankind. 
mankind versus the other, supernatural or complex ideas that are not really personified or not really understood because it's so mass and it has to be presented in an object form. Um, mankind versus, um, I'm trying to think there was four others. And I'll research that and post that on the page on the, um, the uh, artists, uh, think tank artist fights back command center. Um, so we have these ideas of Romeo and Juliet, tragedy that we know is going to happen, a conflict of love, something that keeps it apart, a drawing of two spirits together, and it becomes a great background of creating art. If we take these characters and we put them in different settings at different time periods, the relationship and the consequences of that love change. For example, if we take Romeo and Juliet and we put it into Nazi Germany, 1934, suddenly, even though the script is going to stay the same, the relationship, Juliet being the Jew and Romeo being the Nazi changes. It becomes more desperate. The situation of them meeting together becomes more desperate, a more greater risk. And we start to really see the tragedy and the, the events unfold in this epic experience of forbidden love. Shakespeare did an amazing thing with his plays. He was able to take royalty, royalty who was seen as gods and humbled them down to the level of the peasants who were unintelligent, uneducated, um, kept stupid by those who held the power, both in the church and in the government purposely kept um, uninformed. And Shakespeare exposed the corruption of the courts to the commoners in the plays that he was invited by royalty to present. Shakespeare was a shadow revolutionist. And the events that he was able to inspire by doing that, by making royalty humbled in the eyes of the people, by showing the flaws and the illusion of this grandeur that was presented to the commoners that kept them suppressed and oppressed, changed the course of history. We look at Shakespeare in the time that he did these plays, and we look at the events that transpired before that, Martin Luther, and the Reformation, the, a Protestant Reformation, the, the nailing of the, the rules on the door, the breaking away from the, the power of the church by this man who refused to use God to suppress and oppress people. And we see Shakespeare, who has used his plays to take a royalty, this power domain, and break it down and show that they are not who they appear. Hamlet's a great play for this. Hamlet is a play where the character acts insane. And in that insaneness, he is able to do so much by playing it off. He's able to push information across. He's able to expose things by playing the insane character. And the play that he puts on, he says, the play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. The shadow revolutionists of art catch the conscience of the audience through storytelling, through the play. And this is not only done in Shakespeare's plays and traditional storytelling, object lessons, Aesop's fables, but it was also done through the parables of Christ, who used stories to catch conscience. Storytelling is a powerful, powerful tool of revolution. And as a shadow revolutionist of the artist, we can take storytelling 
We can catch the conscience back of our nation. We can catch the conscience back of the people we need to reach. And we can turn our nation around. We can bring hope. We can bring the human spirit back into our nation. We can show people aren't scum. And we see these examples of the shadow revolutionists in our history, the great artists who are remembered, even not as revolutionists, but they're plays that get played over and over and over and over again. And maybe we don't understand why they're so legendary. They're fun to play, sure. They've got a great depth of character, yes. They have so many different themes to play with and pull with and for theater and for costuming, to, to place it in any kind of situation, any kind of time period, it is an incredible piece of literature to do. But there's more to Shakespeare than meets the eye. And the reason I think that it is legendary is because it's an ongoing question and exposure of the things in our own humanity, good versus evil, whatever good and evil might be. For good and evil, if you look at Plato, becomes based on the perspective of the doer and the receiver. An example I use on this is war. You can have war and both sides believe that their justification of their actions and the violence is God ordained, ordained. Both sides believing it, yet both sides creating violence against each other. How can both sides be right? How can both sides justify the bomb and saying it was God's will? The pattern of history that we see with dictators is that when God and fear is used to create blame that is targeted to a group, four things always happen. Widespread human suffering, consolidation of power, loss of freedom, and eventual deep regret. When God is used in a situation to justify violence and hate and division and destruction, it never turns out well for that nation who claimed God ordained it. And we can look at history and see these patterns repeat, repeat, repeat. Theater, going back to Romeo and Juliet, yes, we can create settings, we can create characters, we can create justifications to explain the moral actions of each character being right, absolute, good, for the good. But we cannot save a single character from destruction. Every single one that was deemed to die, dies. Doesn't matter what setting we put them in. Doesn't matter who the characters are that, we, that are the inspiration for them. Yes, it, it levels the intensity of the experience, but in the end, we cannot change the results. The results are always the same. So it becomes a matter of disrupting the actions to disrupt the actions, to change the actions themselves, which in theater you're not allowed to do. But in life, you can. In life, you are allowed to disrupt actions. You do not have to keep following the same ruts, the same course, allowing it to happen. We do not have to be continual repetitions of our ancestors before us. We can do differently. And the artists are the ultimate rebels that teach that. That's what we do with our art. We take what is happening in our society, in our history, and we take these complex ideas, we take these, these meanings that are just beyond our minds, and we condense it down into an object form. That's what I'm asking the artists to do now. We need to disrupt the actions. We need to dismantle the propaganda machines of the rich and dangerous who have created this idea of nationalism, anti-communism, um, targeting groups as being abominations of God. We have seen these patterns happen in history already. Nazi Germany, 1934 and 1933, 
60% of Germany was Christians. Hitler converted them into accepting his actions because he labeled the Jews Christ killers. We have seen these actions happen before. The patterns are playing out again. The propaganda is doing its same thing. But we as artists can disrupt all this. We can remind our humanity, our, our, our nation, our world of its simple humanity. We can do what Shakespeare did with the royalty. We can expose through our art, just like he did through his. We are the shadow revolutionists. And that's what I want the artists to do. That's why I'm starting this today. Yeah, it might not be fancy, but honey, I work behind the scenes. I am not out in the spotlight. I am the magic maker. And whenever my stuff is seen, the illusion goes away. I need people who are in the spotlight. I need the artists who create to be seen. My work is to benefit the other people who are creating the art. My work as a costume designer was to enhance the work of the actors. It was to convince the audience to buy into the lie of the actors by triggering nostalgia, by, by putting all these ideas into the subconscious so that they believed the actors were who they said they were and believed in the things that they said they believed in. I am not the cheerleader. And I'm not that because I'm a systems thinker. And a system thinker disrupts, ruffles feathers. <laughs> and when you ruffle feathers, you attract the critics. Even well-intended people become critics because nobody likes to be told not so much of what they're doing is wrong, but that it's continually repeating the same pattern again and again and expecting the same results. The same failed pattern again and again, believing that the blame belongs to somebody else instead of realizing it's them and us who have to change. The only people we really have power over is ourselves. And we may be able to create laws that force people to do things we want them to do, but we will not have freedom if we did that. You cannot, you cannot use law to force more morals or ethics that's based on a spiritual ideology or right and wrong and maintain freedom. Laws are not magical. They don't physically restrict people. And in America, nobody is a criminal until proven guilty in a court of law. All of these things are changing right now. And it's our opportunity as artists to change it again to stop the destructive patterns and to bring moral conscience of acceptance, tolerance, understanding. There is no absolutes when it comes to good and evil that even the churches of the same, that uses the same Bible, that worship the same God have completely different rules when it comes to the interpretation of the Bible. Now, how in the world can these churches that are so widespread in America come together when they can't even come together on their own? And even denominations of the same denomination cannot come together on their own and come to the same conclusions. How are they going to force laws into this ideology of God when they can't even agree on who God is? All I'm seeing as a Christian is my God turned into a political puppet for votes. Turn my God into a character of hate and intolerance and division. And I know that my God is a God of unconditional love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness. And it's interesting because the fruits of the spirit of the, that, the, that the Bible talks about, love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, the things that they define as actions of God, 
are missing in the things that are being presented of being of God. And it's interesting because we have the seven deadly sins of Christopher Marlowe, and we see these actions, love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, also played out in Shakespeare. Our Shakespearean plays contains a battle of seven deadly sins and the fruit of the spirit on a moral play. Shakespeare said, and I'll see if I can find it, in all's well that ends well, he makes a statement that all the world is a stage and we are only actors playing a part. Shakespeare got this. I think Shakespeare is somebody that we just have not given enough credit for because his art spoke for him. And within the art, we see how Shakespeare understood that life was nothing but a stage. Everybody having their parts, everybody trying to manipulate each other for power, one-upness, to win, to be right. People getting hurt when that happens, people getting left behind. It's an incredible thing to go back into Shakespeare and look at it in such a way. And it's sort of, I guess I didn't realize it because sometimes you get inspired by plays that you study and people that you study and you don't know why you're so attracted to them. And it's not until you actually start really exploring it and from a very analytical, scientific, and scientific measure that you start to realize I'm kind of doing this myself. And that's what I've done with my company. I created a cyber stage for, act, for, act, for, for the arts, for these relationships to be explored, for the humanity conflicts to be explored in the way that Shakespeare did with his plays. But not just plays, visual performance, music, whatever you have, whatever you have as an artist, your communication of your ideas based on what you see in the events around you, based on these complex ideas of hate and love, envy and greed, peace and wrath, gluttony and giving, graciousness. When we look at it, these are the things that embody everyone as a person. Envy and love, greed and joy, gluttony and peace, lust and desire and kindness, sloth and goodness, pride and gentleness, wrath and self-control. These are the things that make us human, an ongoing battle of, of, of our conscience and our actions, our actions and our reactions. Are they going to be seven deadly sins? Are they going to be fruits of the spirit? This is a constant battle that is ongoing in humans, but this is the beauty that makes humans humans. And so if we're able to take this part, envy, greed, gluttony, lust, sloth, pride, wrath, which is right now represented on cyberspace more than anything else, and we instead embody love and joy and peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. We will affect our future because the AI technology now is learning, self-learning from our cyberspace. And if you take something that is absolute, thinks in absolutes, if then, there's no gray area. Computers, if then, if this, then this. Logic, logistics only. 
and they're learning from cyberspace and all you have on cyberspace is envy and greed and gluttony and lust and sloth and pride and wrath and blame, the lame blame game. And you take a, a, a machine that is incapable of compassion and teach it from that. What do you think we're going to create when the machine is able to learn on its own? Not only can we have the opportunity to affect our nation and our world in this tragic, destructive pattern that it's on with this absoluteness and national, nationalism and purity that somehow is being orchestrated and assigned to God. When these things, love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control is missing, we have the opportunity to bring this side of humanity, the good side of humanity, the flaws that we have that turn into beauty, just like nature. We have that opportunity now as the shadow revision, uh, revolutionists. And that's what I want to do with think tank, artists fight back. We are fighting back with love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control in the stories that we tell in our art, whatever those stories might be. We are exposing and showing and sharing, not blaming, just showing and letting the audience then make their own opinions. We're making the audience think when we present the other side of humanity so that they can determine, are we scum or are we human? Now, starting a revolution, <laughs> when you do not have the trust credibility because you did everything behind the scenes, in the shadows, and your agendas got across because you let other people feel like they came up with the ideas themselves, which is good because if it was brought back to you, it would have never happened. That's fantastic for revolution. That is terrible for a corporation. <laughs> and that's what I have built, a startup corporation that is disguised as a revolution, a way to create platforms of communication that is now ready for the oppressed and the suppressed and the artists and the teachers and any group and be recognized at a corporate level. That's why I did it. It is a way to win this game that all our power right now is in the factions of politics, is in factions of religion, is in factions of corporate. It's the loophole for the people. And in that loophole, I want artists to be bringing forth love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, flaws. Showing flaws are fine. Inventions in America was created because of mistakes. They were not originally supposed to be the things that the inventor set out to be. They were meant to be something else, but something went wrong. And our greatest inventions were discovered. Rayon's a great example of that. Rayon is something that was a necessity in World War II when we were at war with Japan and we needed silk for our parachutes, but we could not get silk anymore from Japan from their silkworms because we were at war. So we needed some kind of synthetic man-made material that had the same composition as silk, the same strength as silk, but was not silk. They set out to create nylon. They made rayon by mistake. 
And without rayon, imagine the things that we would not have today. Rayon was the very first synthetic fiber created. Inventions happen because of mistakes. But in our society today, we penalize mistakes. In our educational systems that is now results only oriented, we penalize mistakes. We no longer allow mistakes. Artists, we need mistakes shown in art, but the mistakes aren't even mistakes because those mistakes that were never really mistakes become the foundation of which we build art. It's the reason it's not cookie cutter. And when we take our art and we try to make it cookie cutter in order to sell it, which is where it's, where it's going now, we no longer have the luxury to be able to create. We now have to create to have someone purchase it. It's no longer just created in order to create some kind of moral message or to affect humanity or make people think. We are trying to compete against the manufactured machines that is people are, are pouring their money into. And it becomes harder and harder and harder to set aside the time necessary to create and not just try to make something that's pretty. Things that are not pretty often don't get attended or people show up or gravitated to. The things that make people feel uncomfortable do not have audiences. But at one time, during Shakespeare's time, the things that made people uncomfortable because they were disguised in tragedy or comedy, because these things were, were shown on a big stage. Maybe it was new, maybe it was, you know, I don't know the reasons what gravitated people to it. Maybe it was just the fact that here was an exposure of a lie that they were made to believe royalty being gods. And it was an understanding that, wait a minute, they're just like me. They just have more money. They have more power. And you look at that in events that transpired after that makes me wonder after you had Anne Boleyn who convinced Henry VIII to separate from the church in order to marry her it was soon after this time, Martin Luther, Shakespeare, Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII. Shakespeare even has Henry VIII. Power of the church dissolves. The power of royalty dissolves. And all of these events transpire so that here we come to settlers hearing of a new land and wondering what happens if I go across that treacherous sea and start something new. Had Shakespeare not done what he did, would the settlers have made that journey? I don't know. Maybe for greed, they would have. But for all the other things, who knows? If Shakespeare had not done what he did, would Patrick Henry have had the inspiration to stand up in a Virginia courtroom and declare liberty or death? convincing entire Virginia convention to come in and begin the Revolutionary War? Would these things have happened later on had Shakespeare not created his plays? Who knows? And that's the thing about the arts. We have no idea the inspiration that we create when we put our art out there. For me, I am no longer costuming on a stage. I am no longer sewing fabrics. I am no longer working with those materials. I am still working with my medium. My medium is the human body. My goal is the human mind. But everything for me is now cyber. Whole entire tools and materials are now available for me to use in this company that I've created. And that's why it does not look like, as I've been told, that I have tangible goals or that I have very clear whatever. <laughs> it's not a corporation per se. 
It is a revolution. And it is doorways for people to join in and use these platforms to bring their message, to bring their issues, to bring themselves up in value so they're seen and heard. And if you go to my, um, my video, um, Winning a Rigged Game, that I'll, I'll share the link on, the, uh, on this page, it has that same idea. That when you are weighed up by something that is of value, when you are already not seen of value, it will get through the cognitive bias of the brain and you will be heard. So if you are not heard now, you can be heard at a corporate level. And right now, corporate holds power. So that is the reason, that is the whole, the whole point of doing this. I'm going to start doing this every week. And because it's new, it's going to take time for people to join in. I realize that. But when the trust is extended to each other, when we trust each other enough to work together, to join our resources together, to join our art together, to join our missions together, we become so much stronger. And so every week I'm going to be doing this, and every week I'm going to extend an offering to seven artists to join. You will have your own webinar um, station set up. It'll, everything will be on Think Tank, Artist Fights Back Command Center, until I can find another um, cyber resource that does everything I'd like it to do without costing me a load of money. This is what it takes right now. I'm somebody who takes, it's not junk, but cheap, and use it to create masterpieces. And that's what this company is for me. It's the greatest masterpiece of communication that allows communication to go out towards audiences, to people, and bring everyone back together. Power of the arts, only it's cyber. So that's it. Um, and we will have this available um, up on, it'll be archived, so you'll still be able to play this. Um, but please encourage your friends to get to, to purchase a ticket to gain access to Think Tank Artist Fights Back Command Center. And then that's where we're going to be doing all of our coordination. That's where we'll be communicating with, that, with each other. That's where you can post your art. You know, if you need any feedback or if you want to join with somebody else, you say, I have this idea and I want to work with this but I need somebody to do this. This is your command center to do that. Then we'll take the finished product and you can share it on the public page. Now, if this gets out of hand and I've got people sharing stuff and you know, you gotta be careful because cyber opens yourself up. If you have a public page that lets anybody share, you could lose control of it. And it becomes one more propaganda machine of somebody who wants to destroy and di divide. So I'm still figuring out if I want to open that and make it open or if I give authorization to the people who are part of the pages or if I enlist people to help me run that. I, I don't know. Everything is new. And until I work with this, I won't know what the needs are because that's how I am. I work with something and then I modify it to, to address whatever the, the, the flaws are or the... the um, um, the barriers are, and then we completely, we refine it, refine it, refine it until it works. I don't just stick with one thing and keep doing it over and over and over again, expect different results. Now, this doesn't really work on a corporate idea either, because a lot of people, they pay money into, you know, these kind of things and they find out it doesn't work and then they're stuck with it because they paid all this money. But whenever you're somebody who does everything yourself, <laughs> I have that luxury even though it takes a lot of time. And when I get to a point where I can start hiring more people to help me, when I can pay you to work for me, this thing is going to be incredible. But for now, it is what it is. And for now, it's an opportunity for you to bring your art in, 
on that page, you'll be able to sell to each other. You'll be able to market to each other. You'll be able to, to advertise your events to each other. You'll be able to sell your products on that page. I think if you're going to be investing your time into something, then you should be able to get something out of it. That's why this whole umbrella is called Think Tank where advocacy meets capitalism. If you're going to spend time advocating for a cause, then you should be able to get something out of it so you can take care of yourself and your family. That's just common sense. It's like logical because you cannot pay your bills on thank yous and appreciations. You get another bill and a late fee. So that's the reason all of this is happening. And right now, from what I saw, it doesn't exist yet anywhere else. So I have to build it. And as I build this for you and this networking community for you, I invite you to come in and use it because it doesn't do me any good if nobody's using it. And I can't force people to use it. So it just ends up being these communication platforms and doors that are left unopened. So that's it. Um, let, let me know what you think in the comments or you can, there's a chat form. There's also on the, um, the artist page, you can, you know, comment in the, on the bottom. And thank you so much for attending this uh, webinar.